And this is a disease, Umberto. The crabs and in the bucket thing. It's that old crabs thing. And I'll tell you, it's, it's serious. It's real. I'm not going to lie to you. I cannot lie to your audience. I, I just even can't. It's hard for me to even say this. I've never had a Latino help me in my two White House tenures. Mm. Never. I made American history without the help of my own community. And that is sick. That, hurt, you, that hurts me to hear you say that. Mm -hmm. And I'm hurting for you and, and, and for us. And as you can see, it chokes me up because um, I still went in there every day and fought for our community. Every day I fought for our community. And I never gave up on our people. And I never will. So I'm here with Mo Vela. I like to think of you as one of the happiest Hispanics in politics. Not that there aren't things that make you angry, and we'll get to that, but in general, I think you have a very positive outlook, oh, and you have an amazing you. path. Thank you. Um, we can talk about some of the projects you're working on now, but let's start off in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, one of your biggest accomplishments is you were senior advisor to who, President Biden while he was vice president. That is correct. Explain to me what you did when you worked with him and how you got there. Well, let me tell you something. So when I was five, Oh, six years old, I sang my first campaign commercial down in South Texas where I grew up. My mom played the piano and Lyndon Baines Johnson was running for a second term of presidency. And we converted the words to the Yellow Rose of Texas, which is like a really popular song in Texas. And we, uh, mama taught it to me at five, six years of age and I did a commercial for Lyndon Baines Johnson. That was my start in politics. Wait, hold on. I, I thought you were telling me a story like of, of like a living room story about no. like when you realized you wanted to like do this no, or that. No, a TV know, you commercial. Yes, it was like, let's all go vote for LBJ and put him in again. That was the song. And that was my start in politics at the age of six, swear to God. And, uh, but then growing up, you know, we would sit at the, you know, we were, I was very blessed, Umberto, in the sense that I came, my daddy was born on a dirt floor, one of nine children, a big Latino family, very, you know, typical Latinos with kids everywhere, right? Mm. Uh, Daddy used to say they would, their dinner at times, they were so poor, seriously, um, the Vela family, that they would eat a vat of masa that would make tamales wow. from a vat and, or, or una charra de frijoles, and that's all they could afford. Mm. And all nine kids would just sit there and get their cup, you know? Um, and so, but I was very blessed. Daddy went on and um, went on to law school. And so we would sit at the dining room table. This is where I was really blessed. We wouldn't talk about whether we were going to serve or whether we were going to make a difference or whether we were going to help other people. We were, we were expected to, mm. do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it was like, not, are you going to go to university? Where are you going to university? Right? So from a very young age, the entire time, it was like this exposure to, to servicio, right? To comunidad. It was all about making sure that whatever you did, Whatever you did, mom and dad would say, make a difference, mm. make a difference. So that's where it started for me. It was una, like a, um, you know, a seed right. was planted at a very young age. And so um, obviously you went to law school you became yeah. a very successful lawyer. How'd you find your way into the Biden administration? Well, that's a long story. Now I am uh, not a long story, but we're going to give you a synopsis, yeah. obviously. But um, I'm the first Latino, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I'm the first Latino American and the first LGBTQ American to serve twice in the White House. Wow. So I was Al Gore's, Vice President Gore's uh, CFO and mm. senior advisor, as well as Joe Biden's. Mm. So I'm the first that did it twice at a senior role. Um, and I'm very, I only share that not from a, an arrogance perspective. I'm very proud of that, not for me, right. but for our community. Absolutely. Because now there are Latinos serving Joe Biden right. in there who are doing their first tenure. And I'm like, you get there and you better do three. That's amazing. Because I only did two. You've yeah. got to do three, you know. But um, how do you end up there? Well, you know, I was fortunate because I had had five years with, with Al Gore. Um, that was a very fascinating one. Honestly, if there was a message I tell people about life, it's, you know what, just keep your heart, your mind, and your soul open mm. to whatever the Osito or the universe is going to put on your path. Mm -hmm. And that's how that, I literally was out drinking beer with eight people. And somebody at that little pachanguita said, uh, Hey, my aunt Patsy works at the White House. This is in Bill Clinton's White House. And she said, my aunt Patsy's looking for a, a lawyer type in Vice President Gore's office. And I, I was, had had a few bears and I was just, a, you know, 
a little tipsy and I said, well, I'll, I'm a lawyer type. Now, what kind of law were you practicing? I, I wasn't. I wasn't. I was working in the private sector. I was in corporate America at the time. And I just said, I'm a lawyer type. And the next day I get an interview at the White House. And this is why I'm saying, though, had I like yeah. said, I'm not going to do this or this right. or this, or I'm not going to do it this way. People ask me all the time, how do you get to make American history like that? Stay open. Stay open to what's, what the universe puts on your path. Okay, now what were the kind of, you know, because people hear senior advisor. They hear, yeah. you know, these advisors, campaign advisors, administration yeah. advisors. What are the kind of, advi- what kind of advice are you giving? Let's start off with yeah. Al Gore. What, what kind of advice are you giving Al Gore? Yeah, you I, I, pre- I really appreciate you asking that question because a lot of people never ask me that question. And it's important to me. It's important to your audience, mm. by the way, because I was both of these vice presidents. Mm-hmm. Both gentlemen, Al Gore and Joe Biden, I was their advisor on Latino issues mm-hmm. and LGBTQ issues. Okay. So that matters to your audience, right? So In terms of policy? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was at the table for every policy discussion as it related to our community. Mm-hmm. Uh, in this case, both of my communities, right? And um, so that's the kind of advice I give them, you know, immigration, all the way to health care. Because, look, all of these policy decisions... Even if it's water conservation Mm -hmm. or environmental issues, Mm -hmm. immigration, health care, crime, right? Uh, Law enforcement, law reform, uh, police reform. All of these issues have a specific nuanced way they impact our Latino community. Mm -hmm. That might in some cases be different than the way it impacts others. Right. Right. And so that's the kind of advice I was there to give was to help them understand our community, our perspective, our idiosyncrasies, if you will, our L- culture. Let me ask you this. And, and you know, obviously, uh, um, the past 20 years, the Democrats have been more open to trying to understand the issues that impact our community. Um, although, you know, maybe there's some bright spots on the Republicans, hopefully, and on the periphery yeah. that they might want to open their eyes and ears to some of our issues. But how informed... Did you find these administrations on our issues? Like, how much educating did you have to do? Were you sometimes shocked by how much you had to explain? I would be, I would be misleading you and your audience if I didn't say that there were times I was surprised I had to do a little bit of, a little more educating than I thought I would have had to have done. Uh, but I would say the vast, vast majority of the time, it wasn't much at all. Mm-hmm. The, you know, look, I think... I don't want to get into political. I don't want to contribute to this horrific, abysmal division that yeah. exists in our country right now by bashing Republicans or anything. I, I don't want to go there today. Mm-hmm. But, but I will say this. In general, um, you know, I think that one of the major differences between Democrats and Republicans tends to be mm-hmm. that, um, that fundamental sensitivity, if you will, or mm-hmm. that fundamental desire to want to be inclusive right. uh, versus a little bit more exclusive on the mm-hmm. Republican side. Mm-hmm. So I think we had a running head start, right? Mm-hmm. Because the Democratic Party tends to start in a more right. inclusive way. Uh, but l- they're not angels and they're not perfect well, I want to I want to I want to follow mm-hmm. up with a challenging question that might put the scrutiny over on, on, on sure. the Democrat side. Sure. Because, you know, just to give you a little bit, I'm, 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 I'm also wanting the, the country to kind of find a little bit more common ground Absolutely. like we have in the past in Absolutely. spots. In spots. Uh, maybe during the Clinton administration, there was a little bit of, of coming together. Maybe I was yeah. too young to remember it, right? And, but um, sometimes I feel that, and I, and I think some of the disillusion um, with some like of the disaffected Latinx uh, mm. Hispanic liberals mm. is that some of these promises aren't fulfilled. Mm. And, and the Democrats kind of give us lip service sometimes mm-hmm. and fall a little short. I agree. I'll give you an example. The DACA situation. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, and this was started under the, I'll put the, the scrutiny on, on, on some of your work, the, the Biden and the Obama administration kind of, they, they, they helped these DACA students stay in the country, but I don't think they got the, you know, they, they didn't get across the finish line and give them the pathway to citizenship. I agree. So what do you say to those people in our community that are feeling like, you know, we're getting a little short changed on some of these promises? I say to them, first of all, um, remember that you possess the power to hold people mm-hmm. accountable. Mm-hmm. Um, I said it a minute ago. I'm going to say it again in mm-hmm. response to your question. Mm-hmm. Democrats are not perfect or are they angels? Mm-hmm. Neither are Republicans. Mm-hmm. The solution is not in political parties. Mm-hmm. Beto. Yes. The solution is in us. Yep. And the solution is in us coalescing and building consensus mm-hmm. and creating community and then rallying 
to hold people accountable. Mm -hmm. And so I don't care whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. Mm -hmm. I'm a very moderate Democrat. Mm -hmm. I'm very fiscally moderate. Mm -hmm. I just happen to be socially progressive because I'm tired of, since my younger days mm -hmm. that you asked about earlier, mm -hmm. when I was told every Sunday at mass that I wasn't worthy because I was a young gay boy that was being told I couldn't be who I was. I couldn't say who I was. I couldn't express, I couldn't live. Do you know what that yeah. feels like? It feels horrible. It feels horrible. You want to kill yourself. Mm. Okay? Right. So I don't tolerate Democrats mm -hmm. or Republicans oppressing, mm. disenfranchising, marginalizing. So if I see any of that, mm -hmm. I'm going to speak out. And mm -hmm. so I hope will your audience. Oh, they do. Right? We have got to say something. I don't care who it is engaging in the bad behavior. It, it is not tolerable. Mm -hmm. So the power is in us, man. Mm -hmm. The power is in us. So if if you don't like something in DACA that this White House did, now look, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna say something I have not said. Mm -hmm. I am, and I've not said this publicly, but I was horribly disappointed with the the, the top Hispanic in Barack Obama's White House. Mm -hmm. I thought she did a horrible disservice to our community. I've never said that publicly. Wow. I alluded to it in my biography, in my book, but I didn't mention names, and I'm not gonna do that here either, because that I think gets down in the mud. And I'm gonna respect you on that, so um, just do some Google research to find out who he's talking about, but I appreciate it. Well, let me tell you, I thought that uh, I couldn't agree with you more. DACA was just one piece, right. of, in my op opinion, where there was missteps on immigration, mm -hmm. right? But, but the most important point you're making, in my humble opinion, is that Democrats nor Republicans have gotten us across the finish line. No, they haven't. Okay? On immigration. And, and everyone's to blame, Umberto. Mm -hmm. Every, all of them are to blame. Right. But instead of us sitting around complaining, mm -hmm. right, and blaming, I really encourage us all to say... You know what? Stop complaining, right? Let's go hold people accountable. And, and we do that at the ballot box. Absolutely. And we do that with our billetera. Right. Well, let, let's get to the billetera. I'm going to close off the political conversation by saying that we do hold the people accountable at the ballot box and, and, and we can't have our vote taken for granted anymore. That's exactly right. And, and you know, a lot of times I even said, because I'm an independent and I, and I, I, I look to a future without political parties and everyone just kind of has their yeah. own personal platform. Yeah. Um, but, it, you know, I don't like it when either party just takes the, the, the Latin vote and, and doesn't really, I, you know, uh, I think that we need to be taken more seriously. Now, let's get to the billete part. Um, aside from having to fight, you know, prejudice, yeah. which is very important, and that's a huge step. We need to be, our, our culture needs to be included within the American culture. And that's we don't right. have to leave it at the door. We can include that's it. Right. That's right. Oh, I couldn't culture. agree with you more. Uh, um, and they so, would be lucky to have our culture. They, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I also think that our community as a whole, regardless of where they, of where they lie on the political spectrum, we, we also need to start paying attention to two things that we need our politicians to do. They need to help us with investment That's in right. our communities, That's right. in our businesses, and they've got to give us a better pathway to higher education. Yeah. More of our community needs to go to college. They've got to be like in your household. It's assumed, where are you going to college? That's right. So how do we as a community also start kind of coming together and, and, and letting politicians know, and even some of these um, advocacy groups that that work for the Latinx community, they seem to only focus really on this on this boogeyman, which is there. I'm not pretending. I'm not mm -hmm. calling him a boogeyman because he's not there. He's there. Mm -hmm. But I want to hear more about how do we get more money into Latin businesses? Mm -hmm. How do we get mm -hmm. more of our people into into universities? Mm -hmm. How do mm -hmm. we have that conversation? See, this is a very very important question, and I think it's even more profound than even probably you realize. And I don't mean that in a negative way. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, it, it, it's a very, it's the most important question facing our community. Let me, let me say it that way. And I think that for me, something that I've learned over these last 30 years, right? In my White House tenures as an attorney, as an entrepreneur, um, uh, business consultant, whatever I've done, I've learned this. And that is, I think... There, the premise of the question has a little bit of a weakness to it. Let me tell you where I'm headed with this. You said, what can they do? And I think that may be one of our problems. Mm -hmm. I think we should be talking about what can we do. I completely agree. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. And so there's a difference there. Because the, if the question is always going to be, what can they do for me? Then I'm relying on them. Right. 
And there's only one thing I've learned in my 59 years of life. Mm -hmm. I have only one power on this journey, only one. I get to decide how I react, how I live, how I feel, how I emote. That's my power. Who I love, how I love, where I love. And so to me, it starts there. That's the answer. Mm. It's each of us has to go inside ourselves and say, what can I do? We need this right? you know, to I, capture, right? right? I think that this is an important mentality um, that people in politics need more of. And it's funny mm -hmm. because, you know, early on in this conversation, you, you mentioned Diosito. So I assume that you're a spiritual man. I'm a very spiritual man. I'm not right. religious, but I'm very spiritual. You, I have the same thing with myself. Yeah. You know, I, I think I, I don't, I, I always rebelled against dogma as, as, as a Me child. Too. Um, but as I've grown in life, I've realized that there is meaning and that there is something uh, deeper. I agree. Yeah, my together. God. We're yeah. like, yeah. Um, and so, uh, so when you talk about what can I do, that's a very yeah. spiritual perspective mm -hmm. versus the political one. How can I force other people to do what I think or we think is right? Or wait till the government does it for you. Right. You're going to be waiting. You're going to be yeah. gone. Yeah. Before yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean, that's the reality. They're not the government. Uh, this is, this is where I sound like a Republican. Right. See? Because the government is not, it never has been, nor will it ever be, the solution to all of our problems. And yeah. it, it, it isn't, and it shouldn't be. Well, I always describe this to my friends when they, you know, because they're, I, I, I'm getting a lot of flack for people for being, you know, centrist, you know, um, and, and they're like, well, you know, this is, it, they, they look at this as an us and them thing, you know, regardless of whether I go home to Miami and I, and I, and I have some Republican oh, yeah, friends, of course, sure. or I'm here with my peeps here in California, and, yeah. and, and, and we got to be like hardcore liberal. Um, and I, and I consider myself center left, you know, yeah. moderate, moderate liberal. You're like me. Um, yeah. I, I was, I campaigned for Obama and, and, yeah. and the Biden White House both in 2008 and 2012. Um, but I, I get just disillusioned with this, with this political game where I just yeah. feel that we're, we're something at the top wants us divided. Mm -hmm. And so they want to parcel us off. Mm -hmm. Because the more that we fight amongst each other, we, we, we won't realize it's really about what's up and what's down. Absolutely. Who's at the top of the pyramid and all of us down here? That's right. You know, That's I think exactly. Occupy Wall Street had a little bit of a moment where they clashed thought. It kind of went haywire after a while. But yeah. they were latching on to this 1% versus the 99%. No, you're right. And, and Latinos, man, we got a big block. If we can come together and unite. We never have. We never have. This is a very important discussion, by the mm -hmm. way. I haven't. I don't get the chance to have this conversation very well, often. I'm glad to have of it. all the damn media things I've done, I don't get this chance. And um, and I'll tell you something. This is the conversation we must have. Why have we not harnessed the power of sixty plus million mm -hmm. people? The economic power, the political power. Right? The community power, every type of power. The cultural power. We should have that at our beck and call. Mm -hmm. And the reason we don't, and I've been giving a speech on this for 15 years, and I get criticized mm -hmm. by so many of my Latino brothers and sisters. They're like, he, you know, what's wrong with him? He's like turning on us, or he, he's mm -hmm. not being nice to us. Because I tell the truth. The truth is, we are our own worst enemy. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you where I'm coming from. Because it has to do with that question. I believe we have a disease. I called it a pandemic 15 years ago. We had a Latino pandemic. You know what it is? Celos. Because mm. if Humberto Guida mm. starts rising as a journalist mm. and your show becomes global and you become a multimillionaire and this celebrity host, you're going to get flowers from Mo Vela. Mm -hmm. But from Juanito Gonzalez mm. or Samuela Sanchez, she's going to be saying, no, 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 no. You got my spot. Mm hmm there's only one spot. And they're going to do everything they can yeah. to pull you back. And this is a disease, Umberto. The crabs and in the bucket thing. It's that old crabs thing. And I'll tell you, it's, it's serious. It's real. I'm not going to lie to you. I cannot lie to your audience. I, I just even can't. It's hard for me to even say this. I've never had a Latino help me in my two White House tenures. Mm. Never. I made American history without the help of my own community. And that is sick. That, hurt, you, that hurts me to hear you say that. Mm -hmm. And I'm hurting for you and, and, and for us. And as you can see, it chokes me up because um, I still went in there every day and fought for our community. Every day I fought for our community. And I never gave up on our people. And I never will. I never will. 
you don't wait for somebody else to help you in order to help right. them, right? We pay it forward. And that's the way I was raised, and I'm going to be that way till my last breath. I think you're setting an amazing example. Let me ask you this. Have you thought about running for office? <laughs> it used to be on my dream list, honestly. Um, I think that you'd be a great voice for no, our community. You're, you're very sweet. I appreciate that, man. But you know what? Look, I it, this, is, this is getting way deep into the personal here, but I'll just barely touch on it. It's a lifelong struggle when you are the victim of bullying mm. and when you're ostracized as a kid and you're told that you're not worthy. Every day of my life, I have to wake up and, and fight through that. And so, believe it or not, I've never ran for office because that mental block still keeps me from, from being able to go out there and say, you know, now I'm very proud of who I am. I'm comfortable in my skin. I lo I, I've been saying it for years. Being gay was the greatest gift that the universe gave me. And I mean that because it's allowed me to have a compassion, I think, and kind of fight for the underdog because I know I, I can sense and feel what their pain. And so it's given me an empathy, I think, that I would have otherwise not had. Mm. Um, so I consider it the greatest gift. But that's why I haven't run. And I, I probably won't. In a minute, I hope we're going to talk about what I'm doing next. That's exactly because I'll what we're tell you on. something. Yeah. When you hear what I'm doing next, you're going to go, don't go run. Just go keep doing what you're let's doing. Talk, let's talk about the entrepreneur and what you're doing next. Yeah. And how. And how and so I just, I just want to thank you for that, for that conversation. <laughs> it's, it's not, these days it's hard to have an honest political conversation sometimes yeah. with people. And um, I, I thank you for sharing a lot of the personal stuff that Absolutely. motivates some of your path. Because you have a very, very amazing path. And I thank think people you. need to read it into you. you. And your book, by the thank way, which you. tells a lot of the stories. Yeah, called, it does. It tells a lot. I probably told more, Umberto, as you can tell, I seem to be a little unfiltered. So That's I think I, I told more than I was supposed to in my no, book. But no. It's called Little Secret Big Dreams. <laughs> <laughs> I love the titles, Little Secret Big Dreams. Yeah, and then the, the sub-caption you're going to really like, it's pink and brown in the White House. How about That's that? That's amazing. Huh? So, By the yeah. way, strawberry and chocolate is my favorite combination for um, ice cream. Oh, there you yeah. go. So, uh, <laughs> right, let's get to the other. Then you can relate to the book title, though. <laughs> uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it, especially after having ta uh, talking to you and knowing you like this. Uh, um, well, i rather, yeah. I'll tell you what, instead of you reading my book, I'd rather us go have dinner. I'm and done. Con and continue this conversation because that is the answer to almost all of your questions is that we all need to come together and we need to talk this through and we need to strategize and we need to take control of our own destiny. You got it, And man. that's the message I'm trying to give to people all over. We, we, you have the power to control your own destiny. Let's yeah. take it. Yeah, that's you amazing. Know? And that's very inspiring. So talk to me as an entrepreneur. What are you working yeah. on now? Do you want to talk about the show first? or the? Uh, well, it's uh, kind of all okay, one, right? Yeah. So um, it's, it's so cool because one of the patterns I noticed my whole career, right? I said it a while ago. is like when you see the marginalized, right? And many times it was our Latinos, right? You, you referenced it. Mm. You know, we're not going to university at the levels we sh should be. We're dropping out of high school at higher rates than non-Latinos, right? LGBTQ companies don't receive venture capital money at the rate that non-LGBTQ, right? Yeah. Uh, white companies receive VC money 90-something money times more than brown, black, LGBTQ, or women. Mm -hmm. Less than 2% of venture capital money goes to mm -hmm. minority and women-owned businesses. Wow. Yes, it, it's abysmal. It's horrible. And so to me, kind of this, one of the things that came out of all my White House stuff was that this kind of fundamental understanding, like you, again, you referenced it. How, when are we going to get there? When are we going to have the power? And my theory now is we're not going to have that power that you were referencing until we have economic parity. Big time. You don't have equality. Mm hmm until you have economic parity. And then I started thinking these last 10 years of my life, how do we get economic parity? Well, one of the ways is we change that less than 2%. Right. Okay, well, the VCs weren't budging. They're still not budging. So what do you do then? You do what we're about to do. We launched a show called Unicorn Hunters, and it airs, starts airing next Monday. I'm co-creator on unicornhunters.com and YouTube and Facebook and LinkedIn and Amazon Prime. But unicornhunters.com is the place to go. Sign up. And even if you just want to watch and you don't want to sign up, that's fine. Just come watch. Here's why. Because I'm co-creator, I'm co-producer, and I'm co-starring in it. And you're not going to believe this. Who's co-starring with me? Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple. Yeah. 
I just did an interview with Lance Bass from NSYNC. Nice. He's on there with me. Rosie Rios, the former United States treasurer. Nice. Her name's on probably all the bills in your wallet. She's on there with me. So we have an incredible circle of money, it's called. And here's what we did. We said, wait a minute. We're not going to sit around. What did I just say? I practice what I preach. Right. Don't wait around. You do it. So what I did, we put together this show. And every week we bring you one potential future unicorn. What's a unicorn? In business, a company that's valued at one billion dollars. Really? Yeah. Oh, I thought unicorn was just made a special and and, and a little out of stuffed the animal with a little cuerno. Well, you know, I guess maybe the CEO has you know a little, a little horn or whatever. No, that's okay. So a, a company that's valued at over uh, a billion dollars. Okay. Yeah. And these are all pre-IPO, which is pre-going public, okay. right? Uh, and so what we realized was, I said, I'm all in this, and I'll tell you why. Because I want our gente to come watch, even if you don't invest. Mm -hmm. I want you to come learn. Like, like watching Shark Tank. Let's be honest. You watch Shark Tank, you, know you learn what? a lot. And I'm not even do. a business person. Okay. If you like Shark Tank, you're going to be in heaven. Let me tell you why. We're positive. Yeah. We're loving. We're supportive. We're optimistic. We're hopeful. Nice. And yeah. you're in it. I mean, that's all I need uh, to know. Well, but the beauty is, here's the kicker. Let me just lay out the disclaimer and the premise, because mm -hmm. this is important. One of the things you'll learn at unicornhunters.com, and as the year progresses and we roll out more episodes, remember to understand your risk tolerance when mm. it comes to investing. Yeah. If you need that $100 to pay the electric bill, do not invest it. Mm -hmm. Don't go to Las Vegas. Right. Don't roll the dice. Don't invest it on our pay don't your electric Don't buy Bitcoin. Bill. So if, if, you have, if you're down to like your last $100, you should probably not buy some Bitcoin or Ethereum. It's about or some knowing NFT. your risk tolerance, right? Okay, and yeah. it's knowing your risk tolerance. Yeah. And we talk about this. This is part of the education process, mm. right? In the investment ecosystem. But the beauty of our show is if you have $100 and you say, you know what? I love what that company is doing. I love where they're going. I love their product. We give you 30 minutes with that company. And then you can go to the website and learn even more about them. And if you want to put your $100 So in you, you can invest as little as $100? As little as $100. I think I can muster up $100 and to invest, you, man. We're going to give you five episodes in this first season, and we shoot season two in August, and it'll be 12 episodes. And these are companies that are making or innovating or creating products and services that change the world, Umberto. Amazing. It's so cool. It's so cool. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. Now, uh, you also have an interesting title with another company. Uh, the company's called Transparent Business, yeah, Transparent and you are the Business. Chief Transparency <laughs> Officer. Yeah, the Chief Transparency Officer. So is this officer. the first uh, CTO <laughs> that's ever been in? Uh, you know what? Everybody goes, a CTO, and I'm like, oh, no, no. I have to ex explain what the T is because, of course, CTO is usually Chief Technology oh, Officer, okay. right? And I went to law school because there was no math. Science or technology. Right. I can't even multiply fractions. And can I tell a story? Yeah. Okay, we're going to go back to political here. So I'm on Air Force Two with Al Gore. I'm 33 years old at the time, and I'm his CFO, right, uh, at the White House. And we let's just say I had had a couple of you know, Miller lights. <laughs> and we're, it was a long flight from here, as a matter of fact, from L.A. back to D.C., and it was a late-night flight. And so I'm sitting, and I end up on a couch with Vice President Gore, then Vice President Gore. And I've had a couple of beers, so I am very relaxed. And I said, Mr. Vice President. And he says, yes. And I said, there's something I need to tell you. And, and he's like, okay. <laughs> and I said, sir, I can't multiply fractions. <laughs> and he, he sits back for a second and he thinks, he goes, aren't you my CFO? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, sir. Yeah, but don't worry about it. And he goes, there's some things you just shouldn't tell me. Okay, that Al Gore story was hilarious. Thank you. Well, listen, you know what? You got to keep it real. You know what I'm saying? And I, the, one of the things that um, I always try to impart to people is never take ourselves too seriously. Yeah. We just can't. And I think that, was, that came from my mom and dad, man. You know, they were like, I think daddy never forgot that dirt floor. Yeah. So he kind of instilled in us... At, I, it doesn't matter what's in your bank account. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what title you have. At the end of the day, you and I are striving for the exact same thing. Think about it. Mm -hmm. We both just want to love mm -hmm. and we want to be loved. Yep. That's it. That's all. Do you, you want to get really deep? Sure. But sometimes you have to learn how to love and even more so learn how to be loved. Oh, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, no, no, you're right. No, I mean, you're absolutely right because I think we build up walls. Right. And, and 
Okay, you really want to get deep? No, we're going. No, I'll there. go deep. Man. No, we're going to go there because let me tell you something. This is important to our community. Yeah. The the most important thing that I want to share about this topic mm -hmm. is this. We all. I shared my trauma with all of you. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of people talk about their trauma, but every one of you watching, and you, Umberto, every one of us has experienced trauma. No one's trauma is any better, worse, deeper, you know, whatever. Everyone's trauma is their trauma. Mm. But what is the key is how we heal mm. from the trauma. Am I right? Yes. Because if you don't heal, then it's what you just said. You got to learn to love and then you got to learn how to be loved. Mm -hmm. And the reason you can't love or be loved is because you haven't healed from some of your trauma. Yeah. And then hurt people hurt people, right? That's right. So you got, you got, you got there's a cycle, yeah, right? right? Yeah. It's a cycle. I mean, I think that um, looking inside yourself and facing yourself, yeah. facing your, your hurt, Absolutely. facing your demons Absolutely. is, is the, what makes a person, you know, go get over the threshold mm -hmm. and, and into a place of wisdom Absolutely. maybe and helps them be everything they can because if they don't do that, yeah. then they're always going to be, be held back and they won't know why. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know what? And it, did you say freedom? Freedom is, I, I, I freedom think you're so right. Yeah. I love that. And I also say it takes you as, as close as to peace. Yeah. Right? And and I don't know about you, but I'll be 60 in October. I know 16? you won't. 16? 60. Oh, okay. I know you won't be 60 in October. I'm saying, I don't know about you on this part. I'll be 60 in October, and I'll tell you, that's kind of all I strive for now is just to be at peace. Man, you know, you. I think that you can put uh, people at peace around you, and that's a gift that you have. And and I hope you continue to do that um, until you're 100. Uh -oh, and thanks. I can't wait to see the show. Unicornhunters.com. Uh, absolutely. Is there anything else you wanted to share? Before no, you're up no. Up just come, just come, be a part of our cause. This is a movement. Yeah. We say we're democratizing mm -hmm. access to wealth creation. That's big time. Isn't that cool? You know, I love that you're talking about that. Just you know, to to finish off on where I'm trying to come from. When I talk to a lot of you know some of the advocates that I talk to and some the battles that they're fighting i, I just I, I try to you know uh, um open them up to making room for what you talked about economic mm. empowerment absolutely. i believe part of that is also educational empowerment there's no yeah. doubt about it they're yeah. hand in hand yeah you're absolutely right go ahead i'm sorry no, no, that's it. Cut you that, off. And, and you're all about By the that. way you are such a gift you're you know what i love your 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 spirit and your energy you there's a there's a sincerity to it there's a humility to it uh, you know why? why? Because I faced my traumas and I understand that I've been <laughs> through some stuff. That's my brother, stuff. man. And, I'm, and awesome. I'm no better than anyone else. And do you want to know something? I'm just going to assume you're straight, right? But, but, but the, here's the deal. I just want our folks to see this. Mm -hmm. We can love each other. Absolutely. I love this guy already. Right, and, just come give me a hug. You're we, we, can actually, we can actually love one another and focus on what we have in common. Right. Right. And then celebrate these differences. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, you don't have to go to a gay bar with me. I'm not suggesting that. But but, but I've been to a gay bar before. Yeah. But but my point, you know, my point, which is those differences make it fun. We can be totally. friends. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's 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 kind of kooky because, you know, I, I want to live in a place that's diverse. Exactly. Right. Um, at the same time, I think, you know, going back to the political thing, I think that a lot of a lot of my woke friends need to, like, understand where people that are not from a diverse background, like, uh, like uh, understand their limitations a little bit. And just right. to open them outside up Outside of it. their comfort zone. Outside, right. outside yeah. of their comfort zone. But um, for me, man, I just like I want to be in a place where there's people that are completely different from me. Yeah. You know, and I tend to think of myself on a very individual level. So, yeah. I, I know, I, I feel like I can relate to almost anybody on, yeah. on something. Because you find what you yeah. have in common. Right. right. Right? I mean, I mean, I think people are in shock all the time because I'm like, like, I'm very close friends. I, I said it earlier, Lance Bass is on the show. Right. Well, we just did an interview together this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he's like a little brother to me. Okay, yeah. well, that one's easy because we're both gay. Well, of course, yeah. we have something in common, right? But it's so much more than that right. we're both gay. But then you can just go right over, and I'm not going to name names, right? But I've got straight friends that are like famous NFL football players yeah. that I hang with. Right, and people are like, "What do you mean you're hanging with?" Can and I tell I'm you something? Like, I think they're confusing you for there's this there's this sportscaster guy that kind of looks just like you. Yes, I'm gonna say like you really, really guapo y caliente. He's super, he's super <laughs> guapo. He's but you're pretty guapo too. Yeah. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> listen, oh, man. I'm, I'm on my way to the plastic surgeon right after this. No, no, <laughs> no. Listen, man, you are amazing, man. Thank you for coming here. You, you're, you're, you're inspirational. Um, you're very honest. Thank you, brother. And um, you're very motivating. Thank you. You know, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna Thank actually you. do a lot of work today because I'm gonna have you in the back of my head, and I'm like, uh, I gotta, I gotta, you know, I gotta do it for myself, like he It's said. all about we do. We yeah. can control our own destiny. And Everybody, rise head. up. Come yeah. on now. We can do this. We can. But it's each of us has to do it. All Each right, of us man. has to. Let's not wait on anybody else. Don't wait on anybody else. No espere a nadie. Nadie. It's kind of like, you know. Que se pere. Que se pere. Que se pere. <laughs> I'm Cuban. So, I know. So, I, I, when you talk about like, like so the, the, the vowels, no, no, I, I swallow all the vowels. At least it's not Puerto Rican. No. Why, I, yes, it's, it's hard Ricardo. to understand them sometimes. They're my cousins, but hey. Mo, thank you for coming. Check out Unicorn Hunters. And uh, man, uh, thank you for coming out. Thank TV. you, Humberto, for having me. You're amazing. Awesome. Brother. Thank you so much. Thank you.